Will you please remain standing for the reading of our scripture, which is coming from Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. This is the word of God. You may be seated. So it is Pentecost Sunday, and I want to kind of explain what that means in that time and even further back. So these disciples are in Jerusalem, and this is a festival called Shavuot. Shavuot is happening in Jerusalem at this time. It is the festival that happens 50 days after Passover. So that has its origins in the original Exodus story with Moses. In Egypt, when they were enslaved, the original Passover happened. They painted the blood on the lintels of their homes and eventually were led out of Egypt, out of slavery. And then tradition has it that 50 days later, Moses received the law from God. And so this is where the beginnings of this festival comes from, is 50 days after Passover, they, they celebrate this, this celebration, Shavuot, which is also in celebration of the first harvest, the first fruits of the harvest. So Jesus has died on Passover and been resurrected, and he has at this point ascended into heaven. And he told the disciples when he ascended, wait in Jerusalem because I'm going to be sending the Holy Spirit. So they are waiting in Jerusalem, and now we are 50 days past Passover, and we are celebrating the festival of Shavuot. So that means that there are people from all over the countryside back in Jerusalem going to the temple and doing their observances of this festival. The apostles, in the meantime, have been just waiting in Jerusalem, but they have also elected a new disciple to take the place of Judas. So we now have 12 again. Matthias was chosen. But don't think that it's just the 12 in this room waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. It's about 120 followers of Jesus who are waiting in Jerusalem, like Jesus had instructed them to, waiting for the coming of the Spirit. So when the Spirit falls on them during Pentecost, there is this rush of a violent wind. There are divided tongues that are like fire on each of their heads. And then they begin to speak in other languages. Now, it's important to realize that they were up in a room when this happened, but the Spirit did not allow them to stay in that room. The Spirit drove them out into the streets, and it was out in the streets that they met up with the people who were there for the festival. And all of a sudden, these people are hearing their own languages being spoke by the Galileans, which is remarkable because the best way I can put it in a modern context is... As far as all these guys were concerned, the Galileans were kind of like the Clampets in Beverly Hills. Like, these guys, they shouldn't know any of this stuff, right? This is the country bumpkins in Jerusalem, and yet they're the ones that are speaking all of these different languages. And when they are speaking, they're telling the people in the streets about God's deeds of power. So... The people in the streets hear their own languages, hear this testimony, and they're thinking, hmm, this is odd. And some of them even say, well, they must be drunk. So Peter comes out and addresses the crowd, and the first thing he says is, we are not drunk, it's only nine in the morning. Now, I laugh when I hear that uh, explanation Because, you know, I've known some people that might not necessarily be a disqualifier. I'm just saying. But he says, no, we're not drunk. It's only nine in the morning. And then he goes on to say that what is happening is a fulfillment of what was prophesied by Joel. And he actually quotes Joel to them. He tells them this. This is what the prophet Joel had said. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. 
and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And he ends it with this. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So Peter tells them, this is actually what is going on right now. It is the fulfillment of what Joel prophesied would happen. And then Peter preaches a sermon, and it must have been quite a sermon. He tells the story of Jesus, of his life, of his death, and of his resurrection. And the people who heard Peter preach, they were convicted. They were convicted by what they heard. And they asked Peter a question, okay, what should we do? What should we do now? And Peter tells them, repent and be baptized, all of you, so your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the Holy Spirit. And that day, 3,000 people were baptized. So this is the story of Pentecost, and some call it the birthday of the church. But I'm not sure that's a very accurate description. I think this day is more of a celebration of the third person of the Trinity. You see, we have this doctrine of the Trinity that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And each of those are fully and completely God. But we tend to spend more time talking about God and Jesus than we do about the Holy Spirit. But I think we need to be aware of this gift of God in the world. But I also think we need to be careful, because just like when we are talking about God, we have a tendency to put God inside a box, to make God fit our preconceived notions of what God should be like, to make God small. Well, we need to be careful that we don't do that with the Holy Spirit either. The Holy Spirit is fully and completely God working in the world. The Bible speaks about the Holy Spirit in many different ways, and I think that's great. I think it's wonderful because you need more than one image of what God is like to get a fuller picture of God. No one image can contain God at all. So when we talk about the Holy Spirit In the Bible, if you look at the Gospel of John, the Holy Spirit has the role of the comforter, the advocate, the one who speaks to our hearts, who comforts us, who holds us, who builds us up, who who lets us know that we are well and truly loved by God. But for Paul, the Holy Spirit does something different. For Paul, the Holy Spirit is the one who gives gifts, those spiritual gifts gifts. But I think we need to be very clear when we read about the giving of spiritual gifts in Paul's writing. Paul is very clear that we are never given spiritual gifts for our own sake. They're not for us. They're not about us. We are given gifts through the Holy Spirit for the community, for the church, for the body. Our gifts are about others. And then in Luke and Acts, so Luke and Acts are written by the same writer. I don't know if you knew that. It's actually one piece of writing that's been split in two. But Luke Acts has the Spirit as this one who drives us into the wilderness. If you look at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is driven literally into the wilderness to be tempted by the Spirit. And then in Acts, we have this story of the Spirit coming to these disciples in that room. But the Spirit would not let them stay in that room. The Spirit drove them out into the streets, drove them out among the people to speak and to witness to what God had done. The Spirit in Luke and Acts is somewhat wild and takes us into places where we never imagined that we would go. So... We need all of these images of the Spirit to have a fuller picture of who God is and how God works in our world. But there's some things we need to notice about that Pentecost story. 
when the Spirit fell on those followers of Jesus and drove them out into the streets. And one of the things we need to notice is that they were speaking different languages. And I think that's significant. You know, all of these people had come into Jerusalem for this festival. And chances are, to get around, to conduct business, most of them could probably speak at least some Greek. The Spirit could have come and spoken in one language to all who were there. But the Spirit did not. And I think intentionally did not. I think this story tells us that the Spirit does not speak the language of empire. The Spirit does not speak the language of uniformity. The Spirit comes individually and speaks to them in their own language, in the ways they understand, their own idioms, their own culture. The Spirit speaks to them individually. So I was thinking about this as I was preparing, and I, I remember back in seminary when we were talking about missionaries, missionaries taking off and going into new parts of the world, and we were talking about some missionaries that went out in like the 17 or 1800s from England. So they load up on a boat, they go to this island nation, and they are going to um, convert the nation, right? They want to witness to the gospel. And they get there, and when they get there, they have to learn the language of the people, they have to learn how they speak and how to communicate with them. And when they finally do, they begin to tell them the story of the Bible, the story of Jesus, his death, his resurrection. And oftentimes, people would come to faith through that witness of the missionaries. But what was really interesting was sometimes they would get, once that happened, they would say, okay, now what we need to do is build a church. And so they would build a church. And then they would tell the islanders, okay, we're going to go to church. Oh, but you can't go dress like that. That's not how you go to church. So they would tell them, you have to put on a long dress with the corset and the suit and the tie and come to church and sing these hymns that we sang back in England. Can you imagine how well that worked? Not. Not at all. The people had to make this language had to speak in more than just the the verbal language of the culture they had to become part of that culture and when that culture could take this gospel this story and put it in their own dress and put it in their own music and make it their own that's when it became a true faith to them it was the spirit working through their own language the Spirit speaks to us individually. And it is through that Spirit that we witness into the world. Yes, we do have that comforting peace of the Holy Spirit, absolutely. But the reality is, most of what the Spirit does in our biblical witness is to cause us to become witnesses in the world. In the streets of Jerusalem, they could not stay in the room. They had to go speak to those gathered in the streets. In the giving of spiritual gifts, they're not about us. They're about others. We have the Spirit pouring into us, but it's not just so that we can receive. The Spirit pours into us so that we can then pour out into the world around us. That's what we're called to do. When the Spirit pours into us, we then pour out into the world around us. So this church, this church has been praying for the movement of the Holy Spirit within us. And I do believe the Spirit has poured into this church. But once we receive it, we can't just hold it. We must pour it out into the community around us. We are not in this place for our own sake. We are in this place for the community. And that's why we have these messages that we have, where we are a place where strangers can become friends, and friends can become family. 
because we need to pour this spirit out into the community around us. That is why we say everyone is welcome here. It is because it is not for us primarily. We are filled in this place so that we can go out into the community and pour it out. And we must speak the language of them. Of them. It can't just be our language. We have to speak in their language so that they will understand what has happened, that they will know the gift that they have been given, that they will understand that grace and redemption is offered to them. So just like that day 2,000 years ago, when the Spirit poured into those disciples, and they had to go out in the street and pour it out to those around them, that is our message as well. The Spirit is poured into us as a church, but it's not so that we just contain it. The Spirit is poured into us so that we will pour it out into the community around us, speaking their language, bringing them the message of the gospel, a message of love and hope and redemption, and not one of condemnation. Because the reality is, Pentecost was not about the disciples. It wasn't for the disciples. Pentecost happened through the disciples, but it happened for the community, for the world. And it is the same for us. Our gift is not about us. This building isn't for us. It is for the community. It is for the world so that they will know what God has done, so that they will find out that they really are our family, even if we or they don't know it yet. They are our family. Will you pray with me? God, we give thanks for this witness that you give us, this gift of the Spirit, this powerful, wild, unpredictable Spirit. But sometimes we tend to limit you, and for that, we are so sorry. Help us to open up our understanding that while you do come to comfort us, to love us, and to show us that we are loved, you also fill us up to pour us out into those around us. Help us to be an active part of your work in the world. Don't let us keep this to ourselves. Help us to be a church that is poured out for its community, a people who are poured out for its Savior. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.